Sutra 14. Natakarye pratipatya bisandhi cha. Moreover, pratipat abhisandhi, the firm resolution about attainment is na not karye with regard to the conditioned Brahman. Translation. Moreover, the firm resolution about attainment is not concerned with the conditioned Brahman. Moreover, the firm resolution about attainment expressed in the text, May I attain the assembly hall in the palace of Prajapati, literally Hiranyagarbha, Chandogya Panishad 8.14.1, is not directed towards the conditioned Brahman, for the Supreme Brahman, as distinguished from the conditioned Brahman, forms the topic under consideration. As is clear from the preceding text, he who is known as space is the manifester of name and form, and Brahman is that in which are included these two, Ibidam. This is also evident from the text, may I become the fame or glory of the Brahmanas, the fame of the Kshatriyas, the fame of the Vaishyas, Ibidam, which presents Brahman as the self of everything. For, from the text, that which is called the great fame has no parallel. Svetashvatar Upanishad 4.19 It is well known that the supreme Brahman alone is called fame. This arriving at the palace, which must be preceded by movement, is described in connection with the meditation about the heart, the Haravidya, in the text, there exists the palace of Brahman called Aparajita, unconquerable. There exists the golden altar made specially by the Lord himself, Chandogya 853. And since the root pod, as contained in Pratipadye, may I arrive at, contains the sense of motion, it also shows the necessity of taking the help of some path. So the other, opposite view that can be held is that the Upanishadic texts, which speak of the progress along a path, are connected with the Supreme Brahman, Vedantin. These two views have been presented by the teacher, Vyasa, in these two sets of aphorisms. Of these, the one view is contained in the aphorism starting with Bhadari thinks, for it alone can reasonably be the goal. Sutra 4, 3, 7 through 11. And the other view is presented in the aphorisms beginning with Jaimini thinks, that being the primary meaning of the word Brahman. Sutras 4, 3, 12 through 14. Of these two groups of aphorisms, the group commencing from for it alone can reasonably be the goal, can prove the falsity of the other group commencing with that being the primary meaning, and not vice versa. So the earlier point of view has been explained as the acceptable position, whereas the second one is held by the opponents of Vedanta. There can be none to command that one must stick to the primary sense alone of the word Brahman, even when there is no such possibility. Besides, with a view to eulogizing the superior knowledge, it is quite proper, even in a context of the superior Brahman, to describe the path connected with the other kind of inferior knowledge, just as it is done in the text, the other nerves that have different directions become the causes of death. Chandogya 866. As for the text, may I reach the hall in the palace of Prajapati, Chandogya 8.14.1. It involves no contradiction to treat it separately from the earlier sentence so as to mean a resolution for attaining the conditioned Brahman. From the standpoint of eulogy or meditation, it is quite in order to speak even of the qualified Brahman as being the self of all, as is done in He who is possessed of all activities, possessed of all desires. Chandogya 3, 14, 2, and 4. Hence, the Upanishadic texts about movement are connected with the inferior, qualified Brahman alone. In pursuance of the usual practice, however, some would ascribe the earlier aphorisms to the opponent and the latter ones to themselves.
In accordance with such an arrangement, they would prove that the texts connected with movement are concerned with the supreme Brahman itself. But that is improper, since Brahman cannot logically be a goal to be attained. The supreme Brahman can never become a goal to be achieved, which pervades everything, which is inside everything, which is the self of all, and whose characteristics have been thus indicated by the Upanishads. All pervasive like space and eternal, that which is Brahman, immediate and direct, that is the self within all. Brihadaranyaka 341. The self itself is all this. Chandogya 7.25.2 The world is nothing but Brahman, the highest. Mundakopanishad 2.2.11 For one cannot reach where one already is. The well-known fact in the world is that one thing is reached by something else. Namaste This section is a bit tricky because it opens with the arguments by Jaimini, trying to say that the path leads to the unconditioned Brahman. But how is this possible? <laughs> I mean, the text that he quotes, talking about the making a resolve or a determination to reach the palace of Hiranyagarbha, is by definition the conditioned Brahman. Duh. <laughs> so here we see a big disagreement between the father and the son. Now, Jaimini is actually a very reactionary figure in Vedic wisdom. For example, Vyasadeva's father, Parashara Muni, wrote the original work on Vedic astrology, Parashara or Ashastra. And it is primarily a work on judging one's character and the possibilities of things that will happen. Then Vyasadeva's son, Jaimini, goes and writes another book about astrology, and that concentrates on mundane astrology or predicting events. This is a whole different view of astrology. And he has a whole different view on the Brahma Sutra <laughs> also. So, to put this all in perspective, we have to be very, very clear of the difference between the unconditioned Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, and the conditioned Brahman, Saguna Brahman. And I think nowhere is this delineated as clearly as in the works on Sri Vidya. Sri Vidya, if you recall, back in our early series on the subject, is the knowledge of the goddess, Maya, Shakti, or the conditioned Brahman. So this is deep knowledge of, for example, this assembly hall in the world of Brahma. Huh? That's described as a completely separate place, a very different place, from the palace of the goddess in Brahmaloka. There's this difference between Brahma and Brahman. Okay, that Brahma is the demigod of creation of the universe. He is strictly inside the universe. Whereas Shakti and Shiva are both transcendental. See, Brahma and Vishnu are in charge of the creation and maintenance of the universe, respectively. So they have to believe in the reality of the universe to do their jobs. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, how could they remain focused? If they were always thinking, oh, this is only temporary. <laughs> 
<laughs> you see, only Shiva and Shakti really know the secrets that this universe is only a temporary passing manifestation. This duality is only illusion. And this is why Shiva is such a joker. You know, he really doesn't care about this material world, except as a mirror that he holds up to see himself. Because the unconditioned Brahman is one only, without a second. So he cannot see himself from any other point of view. It's just like ourselves. When we realize, Ahang Brahmasmi, that I am Brahman, we cannot see Brahman somewhere outside, uh, because Brahman is our very self. So we have to go within, and even then, we cannot see the self, as Ramana Maharshi famously said, we can only be the self. And this is the essence of self-realization. So there is no path to becoming oneself. <laughs> we are already the self. We have always been the self. So there is no, you know, transformation like the new agey people like to say. Huh? Transformation. Well, transformation means maya. It means one thing is becoming something else. That requires time and space and duality and all that stuff. So it is not that self-realization is some kind of transformation where we become Brahma. No, no, no. It's realizing that we are already Brahman and that we have always been Brahman. This is, you know, perhaps the most misunderstood thing in the world. <laughs> and Jaimini falls right into the trap. He thinks that to reach the unconditioned Brahman, we have to go on some path. But no, this is nonsense. This is precluded by the very ontology of Brahman. That Brahman is a one thing only. There cannot be any path to Brahman because Brahman is already here. We can't go to Brahman because we are Brahman. This is just the wildest thing, huh? This is the difference between the relative knowledge and the absolute knowledge. The relative knowledge says we have to go somewhere. We have to be transformed. We have to do something and get something and attain something huh? by means of some work, some action. But the absolute knowledge is that we're already there. We're just covered over by ignorance, by illusion, so we can't see it. This is the real truth. And this is what most people are hiding. For example, excuse me, it's three o'clock in the morning, so I have to wake up. For example, those who teach in the context of some religious or spiritual organization have to maintain a big enough congregation to meet their financial obligations and so on. They've probably got, you know, a big temple or a big ashram and a big mortgage and all this, you know, plus feeding all these disciples. And I mean, it's a huge responsibility. So if you wake up one morning and say, oh, I got it. I'm already Brahman. Ha <laughs> ha. Huh? Then you realize you have no more need for teachers and books and rituals 
and temples and gods and a path and all of this stuff. See, these are all the accessories or the accoutrements of the relative knowledge, the path. The path means change. But Brahman never changes. He is free from change because he is free from duality. And this makes him the absolute, the one without a second, he who never changes. And he is us. Huh? Brahman are us. <laughs> because the only explanation for the fact that we are conscious and self-aware, aware of our own existence directly, without anything to prove it, we simply know that we exist without any means to perceive it. Why? Because Brahman is awareness of awareness, consciousness of consciousness, the automatic knowledge of eternal being, knowledge and bliss. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.